This is so exciting, isn't it? I love it. Yeah, can you believe it? I can believe it the way you are. Somebody got to do it. You play tracks like Michael Jordan shoots free throws. Anybody that does something that much and that long and is that good, it's got to pay off. Can't go there and do nothing but blow up. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Yeah. The main thing is getting to do something that you really love to do. Right. But you know what? I was thinking about something I was going to say to you, Kanye, that I thought was important. How you were down to earth and everything, but you know you got a lot of confidence. To come off a little arrogant, even though you're humble and everything. But it'd be important to remember that the giant looks in the mirror and sees nothing. What makes a man mortal? Is it the inevitable damnation of life, or the promise to avenge fate by leaving behind legacy? Oh, it all, yeah. it all falls down. This the real one, baby. I'm telling you, oh, it all falls down. Southside, Southside, we gon' set this party all right. I'm telling you, Westside, Westside, we gon' set this party all right. Man, I promise. Despite death being guaranteed, a particular man knew it wasn't, and with this knowledge began a quest to become the greatest he could be. In saying so, has managed to defy the odds with the borrowed time he has on this planet. However, the journey it took to find this will nearly costed him his life. Kanye Omari West is 44 right now, and within his 15 plus years of being a cultural icon, won some of the highest awarded accolades in the music world. He's obtained 21 Grammys, over a dozen number one hits on Billboard, seven platinum albums, and hundreds of more awards that follow. My flow is in the pocket like Wallace, I got the bounce like hydraulics, I can't call it, I got the swirl like alcohol. My freshman year I was going through hella problems to lie, bit up the nerd to drop my ass up out of college. His legacy continues through sound and sneakers, crafting some of the most influential music of our era by breaking barriers with his unique sound choice and punchy verses. But with the ego-driven persona he's accustomed to today, has caused many conversations to be brought up about mental health in American society, sacrificing legacy for impact. Despite controversy, he's still praised for his role in paving the way for many hip-hop and pop artists we know today, ultimately solidifying his name in the history books. But how? Okay. America, y'all have to see me. Y'all have to get used to this face. Don't, ain't that what everybody say? Delete that. You get used to me. You don't see him next year. Before exploring the man behind the mask, we need to start from the beginning and discover how he found his will to become the best. Kanye West was born in Atlanta, Georgia on June 8, 1977. His parents were heavily active in society during the time, with his mother Donda West being an English professor and his father Ray West being a part of the Black Panther activist group. The credibility Kanye had from birth came with its perks, but even though he could take pride in his parents' heritage in favor of promoting black excellence, didn't mean they went without family imperfections. Did you snow in my class? Wake up, Mr. West! Wake up, Mr. West! Mr. West! Mr. Before Donda worked at CSU, she went through a divorce with Ray in 1980, forcing her to move to Chicago with her toddler son. A year later in 81, she met Kanye's stepfather, Ulysses Bakley, or Bucky for short. Bucky would babysit four-year-old Kanye when Donda took work in India for a few months, and within a year of knowing the man, had his full trust in taking care of her son. Given these times were financially difficult, Donda went with her gut instinct no matter the circumstance. She had a deep love for Kanye, and made sure she taught him to always speak his mind no matter the situation he was in, shaping much of his mindset from here on out. A young Kanye would move from apartment to apartment until Donda and Bucky settled on a house together. This would be the house Kanye now recognizes as his childhood home. But again, nothing could be simple for Donda when her and Bucky split after a four-year relationship. Bucky signed over the house due to his mutual love for the two, remaining in close contact, but little did Bucky know, he helped raise a boy who will eventually reshape the world. Sometime in 87, Donna was offered an opportunity to teach in Nanjing, China, moving there for a year with 10-year-old Kanye. The Chinese curriculum was different, landing him in third grade instead of fifth, and having to be tutored by a Zimbabwe instructor. 
He'd often show defiance to other teachers by speaking his mind, often landing him in trouble, but he didn't care about Chinese mannerisms, just to respect for the art and culture that came with it. When he got back to the States, the next few years consisted of playing basketball, listening to music, and the love for video games. At 13, he got an Amiga computer to create video games, but he took more of an interest in the audio instead of the actual games themselves. At 14, he got his first sampling keyboard, charging buyers $50 for the beats he'd create. He was inspired by James Brown, Run DMC, LL Cool J, and the Beastie Boys. But when he wouldn't sell out his beats, he'd improvise by cutting hair at the local barbershop. In freshman year, being as confident as he was, told his gym teacher he would be signed soon. But once he became a senior, his gym teacher asked him exactly what he said all those years ago. Kanye had a lot going through his mind after graduating from Polaris High School in 95, and with his fully completed home studio, created a group called Conman Productions. Donda supported Kanye's aspirations when she put in a good word to a woman she worked with, the mother of a producer named No ID, who will eventually go on to mentor Kanye in audio production. In the meantime, Kanye got accepted to Chicago State University to major in English, the same school Donda worked at. However, this wouldn't last very long. He dropped out knowing the risks involved to pursue a career in rapping, but it was the skills of his production that landed him in higher places. With his signature sound and flipping soul samples began to come up to a cultural shift in early 2000s hip-hop. From the clothes he'd wear to the topics he'd rap about solidified him as the next wave in being a generation-defining artist who the world now knows as Kanye West. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was always a rapper. It just it was a chance that now let me word this very well because you might want to use it as a quote, and I don't want to be slurred over it. Okay, I was always rapping, and it just so happened that really, really phenomenal rappers got to rap on my beats before I got a chance to. So that pushed me into the classification of a producer. But I'm a rapper from the heart. Like, I got something to say, you know what I'm saying? And people are like, yo, what you finna rap about? You never so crack out your house or put a gat to a mouth and put your fist to your spouse. So how you gonna move the crowd? I bet a thousand that you get booed out. In the late 90s, No ID taught Kanye how to speed up samples along with other various production techniques. In 99, Ye and his rap group The Go-Getters released an album called World Record Holders, but it didn't get him anywhere even under the release of a small management firm. Kanye was smart enough to know his chances of blowing up were slim if he didn't stand out and most importantly, have a platform to stand from. As his beats improved, he began to exploit confidence in his words, which forced him into a mindset needed to shape his character. During the same year as his joint album release, gained some credibility when he produced songs for Foxy Brown and Goody Mott. A year later, No ID would put him in contact with an A&R named Joshua Hip Hop Kayamba, who took a liking to the young talent and managed him under the label Rockefeller Records. Hip Hop put him in contact with the rapper Beanie Siegel, who was under the same label as well. In the year 2000, Kanye's signature sound that is soul sampling found its way to hip hop legend Jay-Z, who rapped over one of his beats, making it onto his fifth studio album, The Dynasty. See, I was born in sewage, born to make bomb music. Flow tight like I was born Jewish. Used the streets as a con doing. I kept arms, 38 lungs inside my mom's Buick. But even a Jay-Z writing credit wasn't enough to keep the lights on. That inevitably led to his eviction the same year. Kanye and Donda moved to Newark, New Jersey, which drove Kanye into survival mode, forcing him to work harder for himself, and most importantly, his mother. After an arranged studio session with Beanie Siegel to demo more beats, was the bad news that his album was already completed. 
However, Beanie was under Jay-Z's Rockefeller label. So I'm playing Beanie some beats and he gets the smile. I'm like, yeah, it's hot. You know what I'm But he had to go somewhere. I don't know, he was going somewhere for his birthday. So then Hove came in. I remember he had a Gucci hat on, like um, the Fisherman joint. And Hip Hop, my manager, who definitely saved my life, uh, was like, yo, play that one beat for, for Hove. Then it came on. Dun, dun, and he was listening to it like, oh, it's crazy right here. Then they got to the chorus, and the chorus was like, ain't no love in the heart of the city. Where's the love? In the heart of the city. I said, where's the love? Ain't no love in the heart of the city. Yeah. This was Kanye's chance to open the door he had his foot in for years, managing to impress Jay with the nuance of his soulful instrumentals that made it onto his sixth studio album, The Blueprint, in 2001. When everyone realized this album was one of Jay-Z's most iconic is when Kanye West became the biggest rapper in the world's official producer. He was finally making money and supported his mom from here on out. In 2002, Ye got signed to Rockefeller as an official producer, making more songs for Beanie Siegel and working with new artists like the Black Eyed Peas. This was a huge step in Kanye's career, becoming comfortable with the income he produced from the credits of these big name artists, including Jay-Z as well. He finally had it all. Money, a stable home for his mother, and a rented Lexus he could submit as a tax write-off. All of this was great, but his dream of becoming a rapper was shadowed by the success he found in producing. However, his mindset would soon change, at the cost of surviving a devastating incident. In October of 2002, Ye had came from a studio session with Ludacris when a vehicle cut him off, forcing his Lexus into head-on traffic and nearly taking his life. Reconstructive surgery consists of restoring normal appearance and function to body parts that have either been disease-ridden or bones that have been badly shattered. In 2002, Kanye West's jaw was wired shut in order to heal properly. This moment alone awoke him for the need to control his legacy, otherwise his inevitable fate would have given him one to forget, and for Kanye West, dying without a legacy was unacceptable. Take him to church. In the heart of the city. <laughs> My nigga, where's the love? Yo, G, they can't stop me from rapping, can they? Can they hop? I spit it through the wire, man. There's too much stuff on my heart right now, man. I gladly risk it all right now. It's a life or death situation, man. Y'all don't really understand how I feel right now, man. It's your boy Kanye Titter. Shot Town, what's going on? With the horrified Donda West followed a bill that Kanye didn't have insurance for, which meant all debts came out of pocket. Nonetheless, he took this experience as a lesson and created the beat Through the Wire, his first single. In the song, you can hear him rap while his jaw was wired shut, barely being able to get out his lyrics, and without knowing the backstory to this song, you'd probably never notice it. If you could feel how my face felt, you would know how Mace felt. Thank God I ain't too cool for the safe belt. In 2004, Kanye had the girl of his dreams, his mama home, and officially signed to the biggest record label in the world as a solo artist. Given he now has a platform to stand from and the addition of a direct friendship with a hip-hop superstar was his stardom to fame, but it was his patience that grew his integrity to create the most authentic music for his legacy and newly obtained fans. Kanye completed his first studio album, The College Dropout, and got the best producer in Rockefeller Records to make his instrumentals himself. Oh my God, it's so unfair. Once you all see this video, it's the best thing you ever seen in your life. I swear to God, this right here is the good life. We always do with this time. I go for mine, I get to shine. Now throw your hands up in the sky. The college dropout wasn't normal hip hop though. 
It was the transition from two decades of boom bap rap to soulful pop inspired tracks that made this album a classic. Hip hop in the day was always showcased to be about the harsh natures and struggles of African American lifestyle, and although songs like Tupac's Dear Mama and Biggie's Hypnotize broke those barriers, Kanye carried it into the new era by transforming the sound we hear now and succeeding the sound some classify as old ad hip hop. Things in life are free, the good life. It feel like Atlanta, it feel like LA, it feel like Miami, it feel like NY, summertime shy. Ah. 2004 to 2007 became the trilogy of albums that's themes were inspired by years of doubt via school teachers, peers, and the entire expectation of the American social class, which made something new out of the culture, yet remained true to the outcast nature of hip hop. His instrumentals carried weight with his signature sound of soul samples to his orchestrated violin climaxes that complemented his ability to make his presence known as the hottest new rapper in the game. With Kanye's confidence and angst, took it to new heights in tracks such as Through the Wire, All Falls Down, Jesus Walks, Touch the Sky, Gold Digger, Good Morning, Stronger, Good Life, Can't Tell Me Nothing, and Flashing Lights. Throughout 2004's The College Dropout, 2005's Late Registration, and 2007's Graduation. But Kanye's new take on an era-defining sound was more than soul samples and orchestra instruments. In several tracks, he'd implement synth keys and a variety of electronic sounding melodies, along with auto-tuned vocals, which became the sound many recognized the 2000s with. His wardrobe consisted of bright polo shirts that would capture the themes of these three albums, influencing much of the fashion choices during the decade. Because of his music, story, and clothing choice, he became the greatest rapper during this time period. But before the seal of approval could be given, decided to play a part in the competitive sport that is hip-hop. 106 Apart, Clash of the Titans, baby, it's finally today! Before Kanye dropped his third studio album, Graduation, in 2007, he decided to move his release date to 50 Cent. At the time, 50 was already one of few who dominated the industry and was solidified as one of the greatest during the early 2000s. The contrast between the two artists differed immensely, with 50 being the pinnacle of what hip-hop should be and Kanye being what hip-hop was destined to become. But little did the mass know, the criteria to rap didn't always have to mean being gangster, selling drugs, and starting from the bottom. It was the appeal of the success story that made him so relatable, and when Kanye came on the scene, made him no different than a hungry Jay-Z or Tupac. I, I'm, never, I'm never nervous. I, if, if I win, I win. If I lose, I win. I'm, I'm, I'm here on, I'm like, I'm standing, I'm next to 50, I'm next to you right here. I, my big brother just came out, it's a moment for me. This was the opportunity to show hip-hop another side, and this started with the Clash of Titans. The event alone built enough hype that no album has ever seen, and marketing-wise, favored both feuding artists. Busy B vs. Cool Mo D, Biggie vs. Tupac, Jay-Z vs. Nas, and now the college dropout in a pink polo vs. New York's top gangster suited in Kevlar. But this time, it wasn't a normal hip-hop competition. Like Kanye hasn't said anything disrespectful or expressed any discomfort to the success I've been having, so it's not an actual beef. It's just being competitive, you know, as far as yeah. hip-hop is concerned. The competitive nature of it is something different. The competitive nature of hip-hop became a face-off in retail for the first time ever. Which album would sell more? Who will come out on top to dominate the other? Which body of work would overall be the better product? Although it was a friendly competition, it was almost guaranteed 50 would win, given the commercial domain and resume he had to back him. But it'd be evolution that'd triumph what is, and the chances of winning were in favor of Kanye, given the advantage of his skill in production and the nuance of a vulnerable rapper. After first week sales and the results were in, Kanye swiftly outsold 50 by over 200,000 units. This win alone became a monumental shift in the culture, being the change from street rap to pop rap, paving most of what we hear in today's music. Donda couldn't have been more proud of her son, and Kanye fulfilled his promise to build himself a legacy worth telling, 
but little did he know this was just a fraction of it, and his legacy would come at a cost. When I had my accident, I found out at that moment, nothing in life is promised except death. If you had the opportunity to play this game of life, you need to appreciate every moment. A lot of people don't appreciate their moment until it's past. I know, I know every, I know everybody asked me the question. They wanted to know what I would do if I didn't win. I guess we'll never know. Oh, you know, the one I used to always try to get you to do, Kanye, and you never did it, what? was that I walked through the halls of the school, and it's cool to be known by many for my rapping ability, but what about the brothers who ain't got it like me? Making money off the trade, you can say it's good. they got it made. The drugs are on the rise, but it's not a big surprise. I see something, something see no in, in, in the, the young, young brother's, brother's eyes. eyes. I, just, and I, I rhyme Harvard with what? Yeah, you That's said a good something. Right there. You did. I yeah. said, can you keep on doing some million dollars? Remember everything you would do? I said, That's a million dollars. Yeah, and we still ain't uh -huh. in a million. <laughs> 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 Through the halls of the school, and it's cool to be known mm -hmm. by many for my rapping ability. Mm -hmm. But what about the brothers mm -hmm. who ain't got it like me, making money off the trade? You, you can, can say I had it made. Me. Drugs on the rise, and it's not, not a big surprise. surprise. You see no soul in the young, young brother's, brother's eyes. Um, trying so, to harm by the streets, but, but the, the streets, streets are kind of hard. <laughs> But here's another factor that we can't disregard. Black on black is a stab yeah, in my, my back. back. It really hurts my soul when I hear about that. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I always had the words too. Yeah, I had the words too. Our new development is the plastic surgery death of hip hop artist Kanye West's mother. The doctor who performed surgery had appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show as an expert a few years ago. However, as Action News has confirmed, he has a questionable medical and legal record. That's the doctor. All this comes as the autopsy on West Mother is going on right now. Health check reporter Nita Brickman is here now with more details. Why would she make calls out the blue? The singer was in London preparing for an upcoming tour when he got the devastating news. Donda, now I'm awake, sleep is What may be complications of breast reduction and tummy tuck surgery. Hey, 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 the hey, did perform Donda don't West say West you will. Tell celebrity website TMZ.com that he did nothing wrong. And let you out. I started hey, with that plastic surgery. That's why you got gynecologists doing liposuction. People sometimes forget these are serious operations with potentially life-threatening side effects. Grammy winner Kanye West is going to sing a special song for us before you tell us a little bit about the song. Well, it's a song I wrote for my mother back in 2000. It's one of my favorite songs. And I saved it for the opportunity to be on the Oprah show and perform it for us. <laughs> Donda got to see her son make something of himself, but his success was so much more than the outcome of celebrity treatment. By 2007, he became the pinnacle of the new era in hip hop, and his mother got to shape a legend who will define generations to come. Two months after the Clash of Titans event was the horrific news of Dr. Donda West's passing, but an actual cause of death remains up for debate to this day. She had passed away a day after liposuction, but in what would be trialed as a post-op surgery gone wrong, may have been more than what was initially believed. The man who greenlit the surgery was known for multiple misconduct accusations, but given Dr. Jen Adams was a celebrity, his DUI charges and other incidences went without career-threatening punishments. I got a DUI. Very stupid. My fault. Out with a couple of friends of mine and I'm driving them home. Not a good decision, and I take responsibility for that doesn't have anything to do with medicine. It has to do with holding doctors to a higher standard, and I think that's more than reasonable. He was one of a kind surgeon with eight years of training, 15 in the field, and his own television show. But it wasn't until her death 
was he labeled an alleged murderer, ruining his reputation as a man to trust under the scalpel. According to Jan Adams, he recommended Donna to stay at the hospital for recovery, but insisted she had her nephew watch over her, given he was a certified nurse. But this claim alone was his word against a deceased woman's who couldn't fend for herself. Her nurse wasn't there. Her nurse was gone to a baby shower rather than taking care of his aunt. But Donda's nephew claims all allegations from Adams were false. However, a 911 phone call seemed to reveal that her nephew, in fact, wasn't there to help her and had passed away because her bed wasn't raised by 30 degrees. This lady shouldn't be dead. All you had to do is sit her up. And every nurse on the planet knows that. Let me know Do I still got time to grow? Things ain't always set in stone After months of finger pointing, the real victim left standing was Kanye, who never got a definitive answer on how she passed, so he decided to blame himself, knowing the accolades he acclaimed and the passion he dedicated his life to paid for her inevitable fate to arrive sooner. This was one of many breaking points for Kanye. He knew his mom wouldn't want him to break, but instead celebrate her life by continuing to be her greatest accomplishment and inspire generations to come. I appreciate everything, and I know you're really proud of me right now, and I know you wouldn't want me to stop, and you want me to be the number one artist in the world. And mama, all I'm gonna do is keep making you proud. We run this. By 2008, Kanye had a track record no other hip-hop artist has ever had, given he introduced soul and electronic sounds to hip-hop. However, this would only be a portion of what made him an inspiration with the release of his fourth studio album, 808s and Heartbreak. The way he portrayed every aspect of an era without his mother was a blend of his electronic instrumentals and distorted filtered vocals that suggested he was depressed, trapped, and alone. Yet the juxtaposition of melancholy entwined with the hope he used to portray in songs like Jesus Walks or Hey Mama, songs that would feel like a nostalgic, bittersweet ending. The track, Welcome to Heartbreak, is a good example of this. The instrumental's melody dips in the middle, but towards the end, picks itself back up and loops while the drums carry on the same pattern. The chorus sung by Kid Cudi, summed up, delivers the same message, that message being, even in your darkest days you must carry on. But these aren't even the biggest songs on the album, with songs like Love Locked Down, Amazing, and Heartless. In the night I hear in spite of the little details and melancholic vibe, 808s and Heartbreak became another one of Kanye's groundbreaking achievements, given Kanye solidified 808 drums that redefined what makes a beat rap, even to this day. This new melancholic Kanye hid behind Shutter Shades, Ray-Bans, and the success of his new album. 2007 was a difficult year for him, especially after finding out his dream girl that Donda wanted him to marry cheated on him. Although it was an on-and-off relationship, it still added to the stress he was already going through in 2008, leaving him in question about who he could trust, and without a woman to unveil his pain to, meant the pain stayed with him. Donda West's legacy was her ability to teach, and what she taught Kanye was to speak his mind and have faith in a creator. But even with the belief that she resides in heaven, disregards the fact that there was no definitive answer on how she passed. That, on top of the endless court battles and global career, meant Kanye never got to properly mourn his mother, leaving him with his legacy to continue in honor of her. Singing the world premiere of Hey Mama, Kanye West! I want everybody to put your hands together like this. I want to talk about a friend of mine. It's kind of special. Hey Mama. So loud for you. Cause I'm so proud of you and I, let me tell you what I'm about to do Mama. 2010 began a new decade in music, which meant a brand new album, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. 
His fifth studio album brought back his confidence in a new light, this time expressing exactly what the album's title meant. But as pivotal as this album was great, songs like So Appalled and Monster tested new artists' lyrical ability, while songs like Power, All of the Lights, and Runaway brought new anthems to the 2010s decade. But this type of egotistical lyricism portrayed in the music was the way he justified the doubt he overcame throughout his journey. This kind of behavior carried out in 2011's Watch the Throne, a joint studio album with fellow rapper, mentor, and older brother, Jay-Z. Several songs set the bar for collaborative tracks like No Church in the Wild, Otis, and Niggas in Paris. Who's that? Watch the Throne invented the possibility of modern-day black culture to be subjected to foreign lifestyle and luxury, expressed in the track titles, to the demolition and remodel of a $350,000 Maybach. Y'all got the Maybach? I'm on the Maybach! You a customer, you ain't custom to going through customs, you ain't been nowhere, huh? And all the ladies in the house got them showing out. I'm done, I hit you up, man, yeah. nah. But as classic as this team-up was, Kanye and Jay's relationship couldn't have shined more throughout this project. From the back and forth rapping, to the verses in question of how their kids will perceive them when they're old enough to listen. <laughs> okay, you trying to tell me because most deaf and quality don't buy jewelry, that they are more hip-hop than Jay-Z, or what's quote-unquote real hip-hop? I feel like my album, the perspective that I'm going to speak from, I feel like I'm going to bridge the gap. I'm going to be one of the people that help bridge the gap with hip-hop. Because I'm going to talk from the perspective of just being honest. Like, yo, um, I always said if I rap, I say something significant. But now I'm talking about money, hoes, and rims again. By 2013, the variety of rappers Kanye's inspired is tremendous. The subgenre of soulful rap became who we now know as J. Cole. But not only the soulful aspect of Kanye's sonic spectrum made a reach, with artists like Travis Scott taking inspiration from the darker, auto-tuned thematics of his sound. Kids sing, kids sing, and the kids sing. Even artists like Pusha T and Kendrick Lamar found their sound from Ye. Yeah, Kanye changed his life, but me, I'm still an old school Gemini. Although Kanye inspired every rapper to this day, he never truly felt his legacy was threatened by his progeny, and his spot in leading the next generation was set in stone. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm finna get on this TV and put it down. I ain't finna let these light skinned dudes come back and stab. Hold up, hold my phone. Set in stone until Drake. So I know. Remember? <laughs> Motherfucker never loved us. Yeah, hold would have never made. Watch the film. If this nigga were to put pressure on us like that, There were many reasons why a Ye and Jay project was inevitable. The idea of two of the biggest rappers who happen to be best friends making a joint album together would be a milestone for the culture, but this reason being one of many suddenly became the reality that Kanye felt threatened. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if I'm still sleeping from the morning. This is like I'm dreaming about how this is working out, but who knows where this goes? Maybe we do music now, you know, like we were supposed to, you know, or maybe we just start talking more. From a psychological standpoint, Ye admitting Drake being the reason Watch the Throne happened must have made him feel humble given the album's success. However, by putting himself in a defensive position in submission against a new artist meant Drake now had the credentials from an OG to grow beyond him, and without realization completely gave him the floor to do so. But luckily for Kanye, Drake ended up saying, Y'all make some noise for the God that is Kanye West. By this point in Kanye's career, he's been labeled as egotistical, self-driven, and out of touch with reality. But in this clip of Drake reinforcing his position as the best to do it, exposes Ye's true feelings in the moment. A break in the marathon, a sigh of relief. 
You mentioned names like Jay, Wayne, Kanye, like those guys are just gods to me, you know? So it's just crazy to, you know, be on that stage with him and, you know, share that moment. We got to stand there together. We did the, <laughs> we had the polls going on and everything. It was crazy. Like, it was one of those moments that it just, I, what I loved about it was it was organic. Probably the most important moment in my life today, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, I do look up to Ye, you know, he's, he's a major influence, if not the biggest influence in my career, you know. You know he's been a, a mentor to me, even if we didn't talk like how me and Puff talk or how me and Wayne talk, you know, Kanye's just mentor, mentored me through his decisions and, and, and I, I, studied, I studied the game overall, but I study him, you know, very closely. Remember? Motherfucker! Remember? Worst behave. Kanye couldn't risk a rapper who just put an entire city on the map to take his spot in being the next biggest artist in the game, because in doing so meant a disservice to the one true reason why he remains faithful to his craft. A disservice in losing his spot. A disservice to the guilt he feels for his mother's death. Anything in life that you put your mind to, you can do. The world, the world is your oyster. That's all I tell people. And I really have a grasp of that being that I, I nearly died. It's, it's, it's this and it's heaven. Why are you on earth, especially if you're not incarcerated? If you, if you, you got to take advantage of this. I'll be 60, 70, 80 years old, still doing conferences, still doing what I can to help young kids, whether it's in music, whether it's film, whether it's just motivation, uh, kids that don't have fathers. Like, I feel like I'm a father to a lot of people. My music speaks to them. It's a male role model to a lot of kids that don't have a father. Now that I see that I'm successful, it's my responsibility to help as many people as I can. I am a god. I played uh, Good Life, and he was like, who's that singing right there? I like that voice. It was my voice. He gassed me up. Next thing y'all know, y'all had me in the night of here. I was like, Michael Jackson told me I could sing. Fuck all y'all, you know? The thing I respect about him is he is the same person. Mm -hmm. Like, he interrupted our studio session and stood on the table and started rapping. And we were like, could you please get down? So, yeah. Kanye doing that, just him being Kanye, being the genius that he is. And but no, he was uh, like, no, I am the savior of Chicago. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> no, could you didn't even have a record. I've been blessed to know Kanye West before he became the Kanye West. And I got a call, yo, come to New York. I was like, oh man, I'm like, yeah. I do look up to Ye, you know, major influence, if not the biggest influence in my career. Just like being there for me, man, like really mentoring, you know, really believing in me. Kanye is, I think, responsible for a lot of hip hop being about the inside rather than the outside. He's Kanye, he done brought the world great music for a long time and will continue to do so, so. I am a god, hurry up with my damn massage. Hurry up with my damn menage. Get the Porsche out the damn garage. There was a point in time where Kanye was humble enough to make what he said inspiring, but it got to a point where he had changed the game so much that he used his critical acclaim against himself, forgetting the difference between passion and ego. As human beings, we all have an ego. After all, the definition in psychology means the part of us that gets modified by the direct influence or external world, or as an example, how Kanye reacted to proving everyone wrong who doubted him. So when he got up on stage in 2009 and ruined one of Taylor Swift's first big wins, how come he didn't lose fans? And the Moon Man for best female video goes to... Taylor Swift. Thank you so much! I always dreamed about what it would be like to maybe win one of these someday, but I never actually thought that would happen. Uh, I sing country music, so thank you so much for giving me a chance to win a VMA award. I... Yo, Taylor, I, I'm really happy for you. I'm gonna let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. One of the best videos of all time. I was standing on stage and I was really excited because 
I had just won the award, and then I was really excited because Kanye West was on the stage, and then I, um, then I wasn't so excited anymore. And Taylor, are there any hard feelings towards him? I, I don't know him, and I've never met him, so. So were you a fan before? Yeah. <laughs> Scotty West. Are you still a fan? I take it now. You know, I just, I don't know him, and I don't want to start anything, because I just, you know, I had a great night tonight. Everyone is talking about this Kanye West thing, aren't they? In case you're lucky enough to have missed it, Kanye West interrupted a young singer named Taylor Swift while she was... President in Obama calling Kanye West a jackass. So I can name you 10 or 15 people that he wouldn't have gone up there and taken that mic away from, but he did it with a 17-year-old girl because he could. It was so echoey in there. At the time, I didn't know they were booing him doing that. I thought that they were booing me. For someone who's built their whole belief system on getting people to clap for you, the whole crowd booing is a pretty formative experience. With Taylor's uncalled for embarrassment meant more eyes on Kanye West, and in a way, was a smart marketing move that gained him attention. But nevertheless, attention that stemmed from the erratic behavior of stealing somebody's moment, which should never be an option out of respect for a passionate artist. Some have said, if it was anyone but a 19-year-old woman, Kanye wouldn't have done this. In the comments below, let me know what you think. Would he, if it was anyone else? I wish he would come take one of my awards so I could black his eye. <laughs> In front of everybody. Yeah, you might not have put up with it the way that she did. By 2013, Kanye was with his fiance Kim Kardashian, who was, at the time, carrying his first daughter. While she was on the brink of labor, Kanye had released his sixth studio album, Yeezus, which in his words, was an exercise of drums and mixes, rather than a record of hit records. But to fans, it was a sign of disappointment that signified a loss of sight in what he stood for in the hip-hop community. Songs from On Sight to New Slaves illustrated a new sound from Ye via distorted techno instrumentals that threw off many fans during a first time listen. To put in perspective, you've been a long term Kanye fan who just came off the cruel summer hype, and you're getting ready to play his long awaited album, then. Nevertheless, Kanye manages to somewhat save this beat with his punchy one-liners and flow. One last announcement, no sports bar, let's keep it bouncing. But still, this wasn't what fans were used to him making, mirroring how he made new waves in his previous records. But the reason why his fan base was so divided in the first place was because this was a sound that people couldn't identify with, and with the new artists he's inspired making a come up meant he had competition regardless of status. Uh, you know, um, Jesus, I just felt frustrated, and usually I would start the album with like blood on the leaves. I know everybody would even like the album more if I did that, but I felt so frustrated in the way I've been marginalized and held back. Why do you feel so frustrated? You say that a lot, like why? Yeah. I, I remember you yeah. from being outside the studio trying to get people to hear you rap. You was a great yeah. producer, but nobody believed you as a rapper. But, but, and then it seems like you got to a point where everybody's loving the way that you rap. Now you just seem like you're more frustrated. Do you like? Do you not like the reception Jesus has gotten? Cause I, that's, yeah. I, don't, I didn't like the album at all. And I was a Kanye West fan. Yeah. But Jesus was white. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So what were you saying? <laughs> On sight. On sight. But it wasn't just the music that birthed the question of Kanye's limit in being a creative. It brought up the question of his mental state as well. In his interviews, he went from nervous outbursts. George Bush doesn't care about black people. To you, you ain't got you, the if, answers. If you, if, you, you ain't got the answers, Sway. Hilariously, his ego has always been a staple in his character as a person, stemming from his mother telling him to always speak his mind no matter the situation. And although this advice may have been great when applied in some scenarios, in others it just wasn't. I'm standing up and I'm telling you I am Warhol. I am the number one most impactful artist of our generation. I am Shakespeare in the flesh. Walt Disney, mm. Nike, Google. Now who's going to be the Medici family and stand up and let me create more? 
Or do you want to marginalize me till I'm out of my moment? Or why don't you empower yourself and don't hmm. need them and do it yourself? How, fact, Sway? You take a few steps back to go. You ain't got the answers, man. You ain't got the answers. You ain't got the answers. You ain't got the answers, Sway. Kanye. I've been doing this more than you. Doing what? You ain't got. Come on, chill out. You bro. ain't got the Kanye, answers. Relax. You ain't got the bro, answers. Rela- I'm asking you. You a ain't question. been doing the education. Bro. You ain't been doing the education. Kanye. Hold up, wait, hold don't think because I got the hold most least money. Let me finish my question, dog. Man, beca- no, no, man. Let me hear the question. You don't have man. the answers. I'm asking you for the answer. It's a question. Why is it that you can't? You have money. I just you have told investors. you I lost the money because I did not have the knowledge okay, of how so to you do don't it the have right money. way. So you don't have the money to do it. That's your answer. You ain't got to turn up, man. This ain't no fucking show, man. Not I'm talking to you as a homie. It's okay to have an ego, but when abusing the power he acclaimed in a self-proclaimed manner, he ultimately lost touch with reality, distancing himself from the community that he loves. But why exactly? His sudden outburst and outrageous remarks couldn't be a byproduct of proving haters wrong and becoming everything he set out to be, could it? Possible, mm-hmm. and I know when they hold me down, my BS meter is at an all-time high. Yeah, you know but what, what you accomplished uh, so much. What? What? Yeah. What? Like what's, like, what's so man, mad? Let, they want to hear him talk, man. No, no, no. no, no, no. They yeah. want this man to throw them blows, man. They just no, no, they waiting not, for. They waiting for Charlemagne to tap no, these no, gloves no, no. and go at you. I'm not so trying to throw go. blows, but this is what I want to <laughs> know. Let's go. Like to me, it seems like you're such a walking contradiction because you'll denounce the corporations, but then you'll get on stage and say you need Nike and Adidas to back you. That makes no sense to me. One hundred percent. Kanye later goes on to say how we're mentally enslaved to corporations and suggests his music is the gateway to a new way of thinking. And my take on that? Well, he's right. Corporate America became our country's problem when corporations had the ability to persuade our legislative branch. And although that's another conversation for later, Kanye was well aware of this as a celebrity. But it's not the conversation he's having that's the issue. I feel like I'm one of the more important people, you know, in pop culture right now. One of the only people with an opinion. It's the way he submits himself in these conversations as being a modern day biblical figure. You don't think I would be one of the characters of today's modern Bible? And all because Nike wouldn't give him creative control over a sneaker deal. Hence the semi-activist, egotistical Kanye West we began to shy away from. Something different to the way these billionaires run the world. And we not a part of that. It's a new form of cotton that we all picking. We all, you communicating radio every day. I'm commuting uh, music every day. But what I'm trying to tell y'all is ain't none of us free. Ain't none of us billionaires. Billionaires, they don't care. Well, they don't do whatever. You have to be a billionaire to be free. Yeah, stop equating freedom to money, my brother. Where does, where does that mentality come from? It comes, ah. Uh, it's only one Steve Jobs, you know what I'm saying? And now it's only one Kanye West, and I'm just like Steve. Why do you talk yeah. so much about money nowadays, man? I used to look at you as like mm. a real revolutionary. You know real revolutionaries didn't need money to change the world? Malcolm X wasn't rich. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't rich. Like, I don't understand why everything is so much about money and, and stuff to you. Because you need product. You need to own something to have a voice at this point, because I'm telling you... You already got You don't need to own something to have a voice. Yeah, you had a voice. When you got on stage and you said, George Bush don't care about black people, you was using your voice. You don't need money to have a voice. I could use my voice, but what happened if y'all don't buy no other albums? Then that voice, people going to say, oh, he like Arsenio Hall, and he was turning up too much, and now you fired. But when you got money, can't nobody fire you. No, you know what makes me buy your albums? The great music you produce. You know what makes me not buy your albums? This new narcissistic, egotistical, egotistical personality you got. That's what turns me off. It makes me say, I'm not going to this show. I don't want him rant. I don't want to buy his record. Jesus still had some dope tracks, like Black Skinhead and I Am A God. But regardless, the album did improve fan service to the OG Ye fans, nor was it enough to keep him from trying to prove himself in these interviews. By this point, Kanye did have a godlike complex to him, given his status in this genre was at an all-time high. But even though his resume gave him the credibility to say so, didn't mean he was close to releasing the Oakland Gangster in Sway, almost creating Through the Wire Part 2, you feel me? <laughs> but it was the way he'd carry himself, almost as if the people in his circle were yes-men, or in other words, people who agreed to all of his ideas instead of giving their opinion on the matter, which in return created a product that couldn't properly be executed and making his ego even bigger. As long as I'm rapping, I'm number one. And because of this, his godlike persona exceeded his ability to deliver a well-thought-out message, in return leaving him far from the title of number one. 
a spot he used to hold so tightly. At the end of the day, everything you see over the past 10 years in music, that's a piece of me. That's I have influence. I ain't I ain't at live like like Drake every week. And when I hear uh, language, I'm like, man, I love that. You know, if he had wrote that for me, I would have said it. But mm -hmm. do I feel that way? Now I feel like what I'm saying on Bound Two. I feel like what I'm saying on New Slaves, and that may or may not connect with people on the same level as uh, worse behavior. It's Drake season now. If you're a genius. <laughs> Why do you feel the need to tell everybody? Why do you, why you just don't show and prove by actions and deeds and not words and lip service? I came here to Charlemagne the God to talk directly to the people so y'all could understand what I'm dealing with. So y'all get some clarity. People don't care about your rich problems. Those are rich problems. The fact that the fashion designers won't accept you, Nike won't accept you, we don't care. We just want Ye to make great music. That's what Ye does for the people. He gives us great music that helps us get through our lives. You may have heard about this. Kanye is thinking about running. For Speaker of the House. Hey, good morning, Kanye. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Yo, <did> you <laughs> hey, you mad at Jim? How's it going, Kanye? Don't say anything to me, man. Like, stop asking me questions. You out in front of my house at 4 a.m. Tell me, how's it going? It's not going good. Y'all here trying to take money out to, to make money off of us. That's how it's going. It's 4 a.m. It's 4 a.m. Relax. Yeah. Come on. But you can relax. You know we like you. Shut the fuck you up. Left the, it's 4 a.m. You blood sucking mosquito. You left the bag right there, can you? <laughs> to jail tonight Promise you'll pay my bill See they want to buy my pride But that just ain't up for sale Actually someone's uh, emotions you know that I stepped on and it was very it was just it was rude period and you know I'd like to be able to apologize to her in person Let me ask something I was fortunate enough to meet your mom and talk with your mom a number of years ago. Uh, what do you think she would have said about this? Um, okay. Would she be disappointed in this? Would she give you a lecture? Yeah. Man, I can understand how it might be kind of hard to love a girl like me. I don't blame you much for wanting to be free. I just wanted you to know. All my sad, sad niggas that don't need best. I feel like me and Taylor might still have sex. Why? I made it. Stop it. Hey, hey, radio, fuck you. Radio, fuck you. I know it's a lot of real niggas working at radio. Real people that can't play what they want to play because they've been paid to play that bullshit over and over and over. In 2016, Kanye made a comeback with his seventh studio album, The Life of Pablo named after painter Pablo Picasso, drug lord Pablo Escobar, and St. Paul, the writer of several books of the New Testament. The title of this album sums up Kanye's current mindset, being stuck between philosophy, the artistry of hip-hop, and the swaggered out lifestyle that comes with it. The unusual album cover pivots from his simplistic and narrative-driven covers, instead settles for a more chaotic mashup of these three ideas. And with his brain working in a cognitive condition meant he had to get some things off his chest. Fucking cutting!
17 minute long rant got him pulled off stage and sent to a hospital for evaluation, eventually getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He dissed politicians, accused his closest friend of going to send shooters at him, took shots at Drake and DJ Khaled for their song going number one, and hated the fact his music wasn't being played like it used to, ultimately wasting his fans' money after they waited over an hour for him to arrive. I got the vision, bro. That is what I've been blessed with. My vision. I'm not always gonna say things the perfect way, the right way, but I'm gonna say how I feel. Get ready to have a field day, press. Get ready, get ready, cause the show's over. But the one horrific thing that came out of this bipolar episode was the reveal of his political stance that smeared the entire culture across the canvas. Obama couldn't make America great because he couldn't be him to be who he was. Black men have been slaves. Obama wasn't allowed to do this. Yeah! And still win. He had to be perfect. But being perfect don't always change shit, bro. This is the way of thinking to make America great again. A day after evaluation, this happened, and since then, people started to lose faith in the hero who saved them, a betrayal in the man we fell in love with. You know why when I went to visit him the first time? Um, I, 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 right after the election. Yeah, and I, I took the tweets yeah, yeah. down and everything? Yeah. Because I was drugged the fuck out, bro. I was drugged Baby out. I was addicted to opioids. Two days I got off of opioids, I'm, I'm in the hospital, right? I'm taking two, hey, everyone listen to this, please. Two days before I was in the hospital, I was on opioids. I was addicted to opioids. I had plastic surgery because I was trying to look good for y'all. I got liposuction, right? And they gave me opioids, right? And I started taking two of them and then driving to work on the opioids, right? And there was talks amongst my camp, like Ye's popping, Ye's popping pills, right? So when he handed to me, this to me, he said, you know this is used to kill genius, right? So I didn't take it. Two days later, I'm in the hospital. I was taking two pills a day at that time. When I left the hospital, how many pills you think I was given? Seven. I went from taking two pills to taking seven. So the reason why I denounced, why I dropped those tweets and everything, because I was drugged the fuck out, bro. And I'm not drugged out. This, these pills that they want me to take three of a day, I take one a week, maybe two a week. Y'all had me scared of myself, of my vision. So I took some pills so I wouldn't go to the hospital and prove everyone right. In the older years of Pablo Picasso, his perception of the world differed immensely from his youth. The self-portraits he'd compose at a young age, compared to those in his older years, revealed a lot about his mindset as he aged. At 18, his work was methodical, structured, relatable on a universal level, but when he was 90, his self-portraits became twisted, unethical, unnatural, yet puzzling. Given Kanye's The Life of Pablo was inspired by the man, might have meant Ye could have related in some sense. From being the hottest new rapper, to becoming a man twisted by fame, fortune, and worst of all, legacy. But the legacy he forged himself came at a cost of wanting more for it. A hunger for change that caused an unthought out message for peace. A peace between both sides. And although this sounds great and all, Kanye just didn't know how to execute what the hell he was saying. You hear about slavery for 400 years? For 400 years? That sounds like a choice. <laughs> like. You was there for 400 years and it's all of y'all? Wish I would go ahead and fuck my life up Can't let them get to me And even though I always fuck my life up Only I can mention me How many people felt something that I said today? Raise a hand if you felt something that I said today. Do you feel that I'm feeling? Do, do you feel that I'm being free and I'm thinking free? I actually don't think you're thinking anything. I think what you're doing right now is actually the absence of thought. And the reason why I feel like that 
because Kanye, you're entitled to your opinion. You're entitled to believe whatever you want. But there is fact and real world, real life consequence behind everything that you just said. And while you are making music and being an artist and living the life that you've earned by being a genius, the rest of us in society have to deal with these threats to our lives. We have to deal with the marginalization that has come from the 400 years of slavery that you said for our people was a choice. Every day we have to walk into that truth while you choose to say things that, to be honest with you, dog, are nonsensical. You want to think freely? That's fine. I'll combat your free thought with my free thought because mine is grounded in a reality that I have been given and a reality that I'm going to change, but I'm not going to do it by pretending that the enemies are on the same team as me. And frankly, I'm disappointed, I'm appalled, and brother, I am unbelievably hurt by the fact that you have morphed into something, to me, that's not real. That's the way I feel. Stand on all the coffee tables you wanna stand on, say whatever you wanna say, but don't throw a stone, then hide your hand like the rest of us are just gonna swallow it. Yay, be yay. I'm off it forever. Do you. But remember, the life that I live is as a real person, an actual person. In the coming years, Kanye would go on to express more disturbing rants and actions via the media, with some being Twitter rants about his wife and others such as a Band Ellen episode. During the same time as the slave comment, Kanye released a music video that took inspiration from Vincent DeZedrio's Sleep, a 2008 painting illustrating a dozen and a half individuals sleeping in a bed together. The music video showed the same thing, but out of celebrity wax figures. Among the few were Donald Trump, Taylor Swift, Bill Cosby, wife Kim Kardashian, and Kanye himself. Despite Kanye suggesting it was art, as controversial as this video was disturbing, it became apparent this was Kanye's way of staying in the headlines. By 2018, the inevitable feud between Ye and Drake had exploded, stemming from past beefs between other artists and the ever-growing jealousy Ye had towards Drake's accomplishments. Drake, the fucking number one bachelor in the world that can fucking wrap anybody into a trash can that lives four blocks down the street from my wife and like basically fucks all of her friends. This would have been another Clash of Titans event, but with Kanye being the OG and Drake being the newcomer, however, surprisingly to most, Ye didn't want to compete. Some could argue he was an aging rapper against a younger one, hence the Pusha T involvement during this time period, but at the time, Ye was already feuding with his biggest competitor yet, himself. I want to take this moment right now to say that I'm sorry for the one-two effect of the MAGA hat into the slave comment. And also, I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to talk to you about holding on to me as a family. And this just proves how much love, you know, and sometimes I think people don't feel the love. And I say, I can still feel the love because I come home to Chicago and I hear three Drake records, I don't hear Ye records. And one thing that I got from the TMZ comment is it showed me how much black people love me and how much black people count on me and depend on me. And I appreciate that. First and foremost, I, I received your apology so much that it almost brought tears to my eyes because mm. as a black woman, that's what we miss from you, Kanye. Mm. Like, seriously. Mm. Like, I was really emotional this year with some of your actions just from a black perspective. So I really receive your apology and I appreciate it because you are in a position that not everyone gets to be in. Mm -hmm. And like I said, when you speak, the whole world listens. And your voice is so powerful that you have the ability to make true changes that can affect the African American community. So I just appreciate your apology. And that is why I sit from this position and I say my people, I just feel that way. I didn't mean to cry. I really didn't mean to cry. But you were just, you're so important. God, God has blessed you with this ability that when you speak, change can happen. And, and, I, and, I, and I respect your viewpoint because maybe I'm not there that. I respect when you said you're about the human race. And that is absolutely right. But as an African-American woman, I see things that 
my people, black people, go through every single day. So I have to fight and speak for them. I just feel that way. With the continuation of released albums, some being loved and others not so much, Kanye faces his mental illness head on, addressing it in his eighth studio album, Ye. The cover art illustrates a conglomerate realization of everything that has been happening to him mentally. It reads, I hate being bipolar, it's awesome. In the first track, he admits how much he loves himself, yet contemplates suicide, along with taking his family and you with him. <laughs> Later that year, Kanye and one of his favorite inspired artists, Kid Cudi, created Kid See Ghost, which, in its short length, redefines what mental illness is in the eyes of those who dismissed its existence. Kid see ghost sometimes, kid see ghost sometimes. The cover art was created by Takashi Mirakami, the same man who created the artwork for Graduation, coming full circle. This new Kanye is healing from the burden of past mistakes, and throughout the countless missteps he's taken, doesn't disregard that he's trying to get better via how he knows best, his music. In 2019, Kanye went from calling himself a god to his ninth studio album, Jesus is King, a humbled record about his love for his creator. However, critics and fans alike didn't like this album so much, but this time, Kanye didn't seem to care given it was made in purpose of his love for God and the life that he's given him. This album was disregarded by many, yet needed to be made to complete his journey as a rapper. This chapter of his life was finally complete. It's a new Kanye West that you're going to see that's going to be better because of this mental health situation. It's going to be better because of this TMZ situation. And Don is actually... He's icing it down right now because I just told him I need him to be there for me so shit like this don't happen to me. Because it's... I got to return the hug. I think it's uh. That's what family's for. That's what family's for. And you came home to your family. By 2020, Kanye followed up on a promise to himself to run for president of the United States, which surprisingly gained a lot of support from fans and fellow celebrities. The talks of running had been in his mind since 2015, and to Kanye, this was the perfect time to start his campaign. However, his 2020 debut campaign rally became a ruse against himself, with the support of everyone who showed up not exactly knowing what was happening. In 2020, abortion should be legal, but the option of maximum increase should be available. Everybody that has a baby gets a million dollars or something in that family. Every black man Take 
never give up. They're never going to put me through the steel over my dog. They're never going to silence you. They, could, they wouldn't run. They're going to run this. They're going to try to tell you that I'm crazy. The world's crazy. Yes. Yes. I love my dog. Kanye is one of the biggest hip-hop artists in the world, but unfortunately has the most problems dealing with fame. The Giant in the Mirror was more than a story told by his mother, but his reality in the world grounded by a fairy tale life of his making, and this was his cry for help, yet nobody is helping him. Being a celebrity is a blessing and a curse, from maintaining an image to strangers assuming your chosen loved one wasn't right for you. Your mind shifts into a state of daily defense that conquers who you were whilst being broken down if not careful enough. I wonder if Kanye has ever asked himself if Kanye West is still Kanye, because at the end of the day, a part of him died when his mother did, and I believe since then, he slowly started to lose himself in his reality and responsibility to uphold his legacy in honor of her. A legacy that wouldn't have been possible without her. In July of 2021, a good music representative by the name Consequence tweeted, We're looking for a Drake release date, thus beginning the rollout for Kanye's 10th studio album, Donda. With the album title paying homage to his mother, Donda became the spiritual reboot for OG fans and new alike. This competitive nature was similar to the Clash of Titans event in 2007. A clash between album sales, but with a 14 year time gap, Drake had created a resume big enough to be considered one of the greatest as well, winning Billboard's Artist of the Decade and proving to be a fair match for the man he formerly looked up to. I know God breed on this. Oh, oh. Oh. The only difference between now and then is the two successes despise each other and hoping to find an angle in the chess game that's the industry, via public opinion, fake love, and a lot of behind the scenes pillow talk and backstabbing. Almost as if all the sneak dissing, fake love, and celebrity drama led to this very moment, and for Ye, meant a chance at a new victory. To prove who was still on the throne by winning in sales and proving that he could still make her proud. However, Ye had some contemplating to do. September the 3rd would be the release date for both feuding artists competing albums, but given Drake's a decades old artist who appeals to the masses meant Kanye had to work around an undeniable loss in sales. Out of pure speculation, there was no way Kanye didn't know he would lose in this Clash of Titans scenario. In order to succeed Drake meant he had to reflect on the Ye v 50 moments and realize he's not the newcomer anymore. He had to accept this by trading the loss to first week album sales for public opinion. Drake had never had a big history of album rollouts, or in other words, being able to let the body of work exist before releasing it. The extent of his rollout releases have been commercial ad promos to tours and even carving a heart in his hair that signifies a new era in his music, but nevertheless still manages to destroy everyone else in first week album sales and break records from artists like Michael Jackson to the Beatles. Kanye has serious competition. The hype generated around this feud meant people were picking sides and fast. But one thing he could do differently from Drake was a specified rollout of his album prior to its release. A rollout that paid homage to his mother and reminded him of the boy who had a dream in the south side of Chicago. See this in 3D All lights out for me All lights out for me Lightning strikes the beat. The theatrical events that were the Donda listening parties became more than just concerts. It was Kanye's return after years of mental stresses, fighting demons, and the mourning of his mother, ultimately becoming greater than who he was, an attempt at redemption and forgiveness from the fans. This concert was unlike any other. From proposing to his now ex-wife, to lighting himself on fire, his ascension into the sky was unforgettable. And with the recreation of his childhood home shown to those who've bought a ticket, got to experience the rollout of a lifetime. Take a moment and picture those amazing stadium speakers blasting
The listening sessions at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium helped boost audience attention by recruiting the newest and best to lay verses on the album gaining their respected fans open ears. Not only did the new school populate the tracklist, but the return of the throne became a monumental step in Ye and Jay making amends over the 2016 Sacramento rant, adding to the awe of this experience. This legendary rollout made Kanye culturally loved again and impacted the youth almost 20 plus years into his commercial career. But it wasn't just the rollout that made the music amazing. It was the humble, down-to-earth lyrics and 808 slapping gospel instrumentals that brought Kanye back to his roots. From songs like Off the Grid, Hurricane, and Praise God fill the listener with an undeniable energy. However, there are some that go deeper than gospel in 808s. In February of 2021, Kim Kardashian West filed for divorce after six years of marriage, telling her family she couldn't be who Kanye needed her to and how they're happiest when further apart. On the song, Come to Life contains some of the most universally relatable lyricism I've heard in a while. The song refers to the recent split between the celebrity couple, when Kanye breaks down how he feels in his relationship. I get mad when she gone, mad when she home, sad when she gone, mad when she home, sad when she gone. The repeated flow of the section played mirrors the process of insanity, stemming from Kanye's frustration, anger, and unavoidable sadness that he's losing his wife the last woman he can go to for comfort. As the song title suggests, he asks the listener a rhetorical question, that being from the perspective of your deathbed or right now. Did you ever make your dreams come to life? He asks knowing all of his did, yet still deals with the heartbreak and ever-looming fate that is our deaths. I don't wanna die alone, I don't wanna die alone. Even though the introduction provokes Christian faith in a hopeful light, Kanye's effortless lyricism puts a dark spin over the church organs, concluding that no matter how big he gets, his fate is hopeless, but still manages to make hope shine through this dark truth. And maybe they come to life. This is what the Donda album is about being vulnerable to your darkest truths in light of his mother's angel, the woman who continues to be his rock till this day. Sadness setting in again. Donda released a week before the expected September 3rd release date for both artists. Opinion-wise, he gained the advantage given all Drake had done for his rollout was delay his album and carve a heart in his hair. But sales-wise, Drake took first place as usual, leaving Kanye in second for the first time in his competitive history. Regardless, this didn't mean that Kanye's legacy was ruined. It meant Kanye continued making music for the culture he grew up with. Music that his mother would be proud of. He didn't need to remain number one, nor did he need to prove himself. He only felt this way because he took responsibility for her passing, and in doing so, set himself up for self-destruction by taking the responsibilities of a god instead of accepting a mortal man's limits. Drake did beat Ye in first week album sales, but Public opinion often swayed to Kanye's music due to the sheer scale of this rollout and sincerity in his voice. But competition aside, the music was crafted in honor of Donda West, and I wouldn't see why this album could be just that. Her life was worth it because Kanye was able to become what she knew he could be, and now that she's succeeded in her accomplishments, can finally move on in her son's mind, hopefully leaving him at peace with her passing. I'm just soaking in all the shoes. I, uh, <laughs> like, look at all these, look at these designs, look at these ideas all together. The protos, the, the, the versions that you've seen in actuality and the versions that never quite made it, to be able to see inside of this, there's, you know, this is an infinite amount of words in front of you. All of them have a spirit. They're all of the family. There's not one bad shoe. Any of these shoes that even didn't make it 20 years from now, you'll look up and that shoe would be, you know, worth to the numbers guys, you know. <laughs> Look from this, put yourself yeah. in the center. Just walk right here. You can step on some of these. Come to the middle. Don't worry about stepping on them. I know the maker. <laughs> uh. 
How do you feel? Steel. Patient. And blessed. Forever and Can you hear me? Yeah. Forever and forever. forever. In October of 2021, Kanye officially changed his name to Ye, an abbreviated version of his birth name, but also a commonly used word in the Bible which means you. The meaning behind this was to signify a change in who he is, an ever-evolving artist who wants to do better every chance he gets. Ye isn't about himself anymore, he's about everyone, and his recent music reflects that. I've never believed he had a different end goal, just different ways of executing it, but I can't help to believe that the end goal is a new world under his philosophy, something not everyone wants to accept. It seems like the activist in Kanye stemmed from corporations, marginalizing him as a public figure with power who has no idea how to run a business. But little did corporate America know, the Yeezy brand became Ye's first billion dollar business, officially making Ye the second billionaire rapper, with the first being his big brother Jay-Z, ultimately proving them wrong. The passion Ye has for art reaches beyond just music and sneakers, but in the fashion world as well. With the passing of Virgil Abloh this year meant Kanye's rumored to be taking over the creative director role at Louis Vuitton, a step in a direction he's been headed towards since 2013. The Clash of Titans event brought up the conversation of what made a rapper a rapper, but if it wasn't for Kanye, many artists nowadays wouldn't have been able to thrive, let alone exist. Drake and Kanye recently made up, but instead of behind the scenes, did it publicly to show the world they're ready to put their beefs behind them in an attempt to free Larry Hoover. The joint concert was one of a kind, one that felt impossible, but within a short few months of their albums releasing, made it happen. You can argue that their beef was faked, but... But on the topic of beefs, Kanye's true enemies were two things, TMZ and himself. The Charleston presidential rally was an absolute disaster, all 63 minutes of it. I think the White House is a milestone he's given up for now, and instead wants to pursue a new chapter in his life, a chapter he still sees with Kim and with the fans. Although his bipolar disorder doesn't define him, it made the situation at TMZ worse. This is the part where I wish Kanye wouldn't pay the press any minds, when they're clearly eating this shit up. Eve made Adam eat an apple, and then it became illegal to be naked. It's in the Bible. I'm a Christian. But even with all the wacky things he said, Kanye has always been an activist for African American communities, given his parents played roles during times of segregation. However, the pressures of losing popularity to new artists, being roasted by the first black president, getting denied by Nike to have creative control over his shoe, and the lack of value in women surrounding his life left him under a type of pressure no one can handle so easily. Nevertheless, he shouldn't be demonstrated as a lunatic just another mortal human being with flaws that happens to have a vast amount of public persuasion in modern America. His legacy speaks for itself, simply by saying, if it wasn't for Kanye West, which, in itself, opens a conversation that's hard to debate against. But Kanye West shouldn't only be known as the greatest to do it. He should be known for being able to use your imagination as a gateway to mental freedom throughout each body of work via nostalgia, introspective, ill-minded or boastful emotions because at the end of the day it wouldn't matter whose opinion determines a victor when it's the genius of his madness that created his legacy and now yours too but we know that at the end of the day everything that's happened for kanye was because of one person and if it wasn't for her yay wouldn't be yay nor would we love him now more than ever despite his questionable moments honestly i think it's safe to say the man just misses his mother forever what did I teach him? Glory. And why Kanye ain't scared? La 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 la
Outstanding son. Wow. Really are pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool. The best, as a matter of fact. I work. Yep. <laughs> you the best, Bob. Oh. oh. <laughs>